today on Truths That Transform. Future generations will be directly impacted by the priority that this generation places on developing young men and women with a biblical worldview. Social justice is really the marching orders of wokeness as a movement. Hello and welcome. I'm Pastor Rob Pacienza. No doubt you've noticed the emergence of the woke movement in America, wondering how we've gone so far astray so quickly. The term woke is a slang term that the dictionary now defines as being conscious of racial discrimination in society and other forms of oppression and injustice. Of course, it's good to be aware of sinful racial discrimination, oppression, and injustice, but this movement has redefined all those terms and more. Indeed, as you'll see on today's program, so-called social justice is often the very opposite of true biblical justice. And you'll hear about one man who first saw this in great detail 100 years ago. You'll also discover the truth and the reason for confidence and hope about our future. We begin with a look at this false notion of social justice that has invaded our culture, giving us things like critical race theory. And even some Christian churches have been complicit. Our very own John Rave has more. You will hear people who oppose racial justice say, the remedy is way greater than I can bear. How many times you hear that in a conversation about reparations? Oh, that's going to cost too much. Thabiti Anyabwile was once a staple at evangelical Bible-based conferences like Together for the Gospel and the Gospel Coalition. But more recently, he has begun advocating for race-based conceptions of so-called social justice, as have numerous other Christian leaders. We cannot have the perpetrators of injustice centering themselves in conversations about the redress of injustice. In this notion of justice, the distant descendants of slaveholders are considered guilty of the crimes committed by their ancestors hundreds of years before them, and as a result must simply shut up and pay money in reparations to the distant descendants of victims. But is this actually justice? In Ezekiel, the Lord says to the prophet, the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. It seems that fashionable renderings of modern social justice are out of alignment with the Word of God. Social justice is really the marching orders of wokeness as a movement. Social justice is that system of justice that is truly no justice at all. It's just leftism with a new, a new name, a new name, name badge. Uh, it's, it's that system, uh, it's, that, it's that ideology that tries to remake society uh, to give deprivileged groups power. As with so many other things, the social justice movement relies on the redefinition of key terms. Nobody would want to be against justice, but the crux of the issue is, how are you defining justice? When somebody says that they are in favor of social justice, ask, what does that mean? because social justice today can mean sexual radicalism. It means the misuse of the word justice in so many different contexts. After all, we have economic justice. We have environmental justice. We have marriage justice, same-sex marriage. We have income justice, you know, income equality. We have to ask those questions just because the word justice is used doesn't mean that it's a legitimate use of the word. 
We have to be absolutely aware that the social justice movement is just a movement to move us away from the gospel using a lot of terminology that we would regard as good. You got to watch the language because what they're using that language for is a completely different movement than biblical Christianity. Now let's remember that the key to history for Marx was oppression. So what he saw was we should divide people into two groups. There's the oppressors which it so happens are the whites, and the oppressed, which is the black community, we have to divide them into two groups, and we have to think not in terms of the individual, but in terms of the group. And if we divide them in this way, we have to simply create conflict, continual conflict, until the oppressed overcome the oppressors. And that's why critical race theory and all of these ideas of diversity studies are not intended to solve any problems. Yet this Marxist framework is now being adopted in growing numbers of Christian institutions. Your church sadly could be becoming woke when you're hearing your pastor say things like white people should confess their white privilege or we live in a system of white supremacy or America is a systemically racist or systemically unjust country. Um, all these kind of ideas are out there today. Uh, I've heard examples of those formulations in numerous pulpits in America. Um, pastors are sadly, tragically, buying into the ideology of wokeness. This so-called woke movement that is infecting even Christian institutions relies on the dubious insights of Marxist critical theory to cast everyone as either oppressor or oppressed, with justice requiring a reversal of those roles based on race, sex, gender, and so forth. This ideology really is, it's critical theory, critical social justice. Uh, people are talking about critical race theory right now, but all of this is really just a manifestation of this neo-Marxist ideology that takes Marx's ideas, which were primarily economic, and then applies them um, to more broadly um, to, uh, to cultures. Critical theory is a critique, is a criticizing of our system, seeking to undermine it and to replace it with a socialistic paradigm. But critical theory, out of that comes critical race theory, out of that comes liberation theology, social justice, intersectionality, cancel culture, all of that are tools in the Marxist box for one purpose, to cause division and chaos. For them, out of chaos comes a new order. There are major organizations, major evangelical organizations and ministries that have either refused to speak out against this um, or have begun to espouse some of these ideologies or have just outright fallen prey and it's amazing to me the number of Christian ministries um, that fall into that latter category. I hear from people all the time um, who are either contemplating leaving or have left some of these organizations because they're pushing CRT and intersectionality and critical social justice um, and it's really sad. Churches and Christian organizations are now being faced with a stark choice. Adopt the fashionable theories of social justice arising out of Marxism or stand upon the word of God against the culture. You have people standing on either side of a fault. The big one's coming and, and when it does, uh, it's going to be catastrophic. And uh, I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing families divided and churches divided and ministries and whole denominations and universities being divided over this issue. And I think more significantly that there are people who are going to be shipwrecked in their faith because of embracing this ideology that's antithetical to biblical truth. When we talk about the church in America, you've got to recognize that there are two churches in America. There is the biblical church who believe in the inerrancy and infallibility of the scriptures and they hearken to the voice of Christ and they take their marching orders from Christ. Then there's the cultural church. The cultural church is more concerned about the culture and they adhere to the political correctness of the hour 
and bow the knee to tolerance. The church cannot submit on these issues. We cannot interpret the Bible in light of the culture. What we have to do is to interpret the culture in light of the Bible. It's disturbing when false ideas begin to seep into the church, and it can be confusing. Things like justice and racial reconciliation are good things, while many of these movements using these terms are bad news. So how do we know the difference? The key is to have a truly biblical worldview, an understanding of everything around us that's formed by the Word of God. As I recently explained to our congregation here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in South Florida, Worldview Matters. This week we are looking at Romans chapter 12, simply two verses, one and two, in a message entitled, Worldview Matters. Recently, George Barna surveyed, and he said that under 10% of North American Christians operate with a biblical worldview that less than 10% of Christians in North America view all of life and think through all of life with another grid other than the infallible Word of God. Worldview matters. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The grass withers and the flower fades, but know not the word of our Lord. It stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. Worldview matters. Paul says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He was saying that the way to be transformed in the Christian life is to not check our minds at the door, but instead have our minds renewed, renewed by the living Word of God, to have every thought take captive by Jesus Christ. Future generations in the church will be directly impacted by the priority that this generation places on developing young men and women with a biblical worldview. Our headmaster, Dr. Joel Satterley, often reminds his faculty and staff that a child between kindergarten and 12th grade has 16,000 instructional hours in the classroom. And make no mistake about it, those 16,000 hours are being used for better or for worse to shape worldview. The first thing I want to point out to you is that a biblical worldview is first and foremost grounded in the gospel. What we do is informed by what Christ has done for us. This is a matter of identity so that our identity is not grounded in our works, in our work righteousness, but our identity and how we think and how we act and how we live out the Christian life is solely grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because how we think and how we act must be grounded not in what we do, but what in Christ has done for us. That's the difference between God-centered theology and life and man-centered philosophy and life. The difference between theism and atheism. What's the spirit of our age today in the 21st century? There's many ideologies we could point to, but one of the most predominant ideologies is secular humanism. To be secular simply means to be divorced from the things of God. A secular society means that religion and the things of God have no place in society or the public square. And Paul says, don't do it. Do not be conformed to the spirit of this age. How do we see secular humanism in our day? Well, one of the ways that we see it and one of the most predominant ways we see it is through public education. 
There is no greater influence on the next generation and those 16,000 hours than public education in North America. I received this quote from our good friend, Dr. Peter Loback, who's with us this morning, just on Friday. It was a quote from C.F. Potter, who was the signer of the Humanist Manifesto. He was an associate of John Dewey, considered the father of progressive public education. And this is what Charles Francis Potter said. Education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism. And every public in school is a school of humanism. What can their theistic Sunday school meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teachings? Do you know when he said that quote? Within the last five years? 1934. For nearly 100 years, we have been giving our children over to not schools, but federally mandated indoctrination centers that corrupt their minds and their hearts, and we wonder why society is in the state that it is today. Not only do we see it in public education, but we see it in media. And when I say media, I'm speaking in broad categories. News, movies, social media, these are the great philosophers of our day spending billions of dollars a year to corrupt our minds, and Christians are just as guilty. We will celebrate same-sex marriage, and we will celebrate all of the ideologies that are being pushed upon this next generation through the use of media. Public education and media, as long as it's entertaining and fulfilling its desired end and we have allowed an entire generation to slip away and to have their minds corrupted instead of embracing the pursuit of a biblical worldview. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this age. If the spirit of this age is not relenting, if the spirit of this age will not quit, what are we doing in the midst of the spirit of this age to not conform? but instead develop a gospel-centered framework so that you're able to think about the origin of the universe, truth, sin, gender and sexuality, marriage and family, economics and finance, politics and government, all through one lens, the lens of God's infallible word. A few years ago, a poll was taken with parents in the church and 97% of parents in the North American church said they made it their highest priority to raise up their children with a biblical worldview. 97% of the parents think they're killing it and nailing it. But the numbers speak to the contrary. 57% of children that are raised in the church by the time they reach 15 years of age walk away from the faith. 72% walk away from the faith by the time they reach their freshman year of college. So as much as we think that we are the greatest influence in the lives of our ch children, no, the culture is winning. We are not the greatest influence. And we, it is, we are long overdue to recommit ourselves, to recommit as the people of God, to double down and say, we will not lose this generation that we will invest all of our time and all of our resources to raising up a generation that loves the kingdom of God more than the kingdom of this world. To say, no, the culture will not win, that the spirit of this age will not take our children's minds, but that we as a church and as a school community will do everything in our power by God's grace and for his glory to not allow this generation to be swept away by the spirit of this age so that they may be transformed by the renewing of their mind. This is the Christian life. This is the purpose of this church. This is our holy calling. And so I leave you with this. By his mercy, I appeal to you, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, I pray 
that in light of your mercy, we might offer our lives, the entirety of our lives, as a living sacrifice to you. That our worldview would be grounded in one thing and one thing only, what Jesus Christ has done for us through his life and death and resurrection. May we together pursue a new way of thinking a way of thinking that transforms us from the inside out for the sake of the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. May that be the high and holy calling of this generation in the 21st century. And Lord, would you work in us by your spirit? Would you cause there to be revival, revival that leads to reformation? Because this is my Father's world. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy. The rejection of God began in the Garden of Eden, but we often fail to see the different ways God is dismissed in our own day. As Dr. Pacienza just shared, our children are flooded with a humanistic worldview in school, in the media, and in entertainment. That's why it's so vitally important to re-examine everything according to God's word and to reject the world's ways of unbelief no matter how appealing they sound. One example is so-called social justice. On its face, it sounds great and many Christians have embraced it. But what really is social justice? And what is the agenda behind it? The answer is fascinating and alarming, as you'll discover in the intriguing DVD featuring well-known author and speaker, Dr. Vodi Bauckham. He shows that the unmistakable fingerprints of Marxism are all over social justice, which is even promoted from the pulpits of some woke churches. Find out why social justice is a dangerous deception that takes us down the road to socialism and ruin in Dr. Vodi Bakum's fascinating and enlightening talk, Biblical Justice versus Social Justice. We'll send it to you as our thanks for your generous donation to the work of this ministry. Plus, as a bonus, we'll also include his important message in a handsome booklet. Far too many American churches are going woke. They are adopting so-called social justice and other far-left ideas that pose a real danger to faith and freedom. That's why, as thanks for your gift of $50 or more, we'll send you both Vody Bauckham's DVD and the best-selling hardcover book, Christianity and Wokeness, How the Social Justice Movement is Hijacking the Gospel and the Way to Stop It. The author, Dr. Owen Strawn, is a seminary professor and a theologian who has carefully studied the cultural Marxism of the woke movement. In this outstanding book, he gives you troubling evidence showing how the church is being infected with false notions of justice that actually encourage racism, resentment, and partiality. Our friend Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council says that Christianity and wokeness is a valuable and insightful resource on critical race theory, intersectionality, and woke culture. So get your copy today. That's the special DVD presentation and booklet, Biblical Justice versus Social Justice by Dr. Vodi Bakum as thanks for your generous donation. And the DVD plus the insightful, highly readable hardcover book, Christianity and Wokeness from Dr. Owen Strawn as thanks for your donation of $50 or more. Your donation helps us to broadcast the gospel and to counter the lies of the culture with the truth of God through TV, radio, internet, print, and more. So please give generously. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. We live in a time of immediacy. With technological innovations and the forward march of history, what value could there be in a 100-year-old book? Well, quite a bit, as it turns out. In 1923, 100 years ago, the great Christian scholar J. Gresham Machen wrote his landmark book, Christianity and Liberalism. Machen was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, 
which had been the greatest evangelical seminary in America. But Machen saw it straying away from its biblical foundations. Many members of the faculty were embracing what was called modernism or liberal theology. This viewpoint said that the Bible had errors in it and was the product of human reflection rather than divine inspiration. It attempted to make Christianity more appealing in a scientific age when the miraculous was considered superstitious. This liberalism diminished the divinity of Jesus, focusing on his humanity, and it turned the cross into mere example, a demonstration of God's universal love rather than a substitutionary atonement for God's wrath against sin. What J. Grussom Machen began to realize is that while his liberal colleagues were using the same Christian vocabulary he was, they were investing those words with an entirely new meaning that relied much more on fashionable ideas than on the biblical context. This is where Machen made his most important observation. This theological liberalism, he said, was not merely another flavor of Christianity. It was an entirely different religion altogether. Machen wrote, the greatest menace to the Christian church today comes not from the enemies outside, but from the enemies within. It comes from the presence within the church of a type of faith and practice that is anti-Christian to the core. That was written in 1923, but it could have just as easily been written in 2023. For in our own day, we once again see the same thing happening. A form of Marxism, which is rooted in explicit atheism, has infected the church through so-called social justice, critical race theory, the embrace of sexual and gender deviance under the banner of love, and much more. This false religion co-ops Christian terms but teaches a program of salvation that comes not through a supernatural Christ, but through endless penance paid in reparations, sensitivity training, and bowing at the feet of the aggrieved. It promises to deliver us not into God's glorious heaven, but into the self-realization of faithfulness to one's authentic inner self above all else. J. Gresham Machen may not have heard the term woke Christianity in 1923, but he saw its substance. It is not a different interpretation of Christianity. It is another religion altogether. Thank you so much for being with us today. We invite you to stay up to date by connecting with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter X and YouTube. And also please check out our podcast, The City of God at cityofgodpodcast.com and on all our major podcast platforms. Finally, we invite you to join us any Sunday here at Coral Ridge in Fort Lauderdale for worship. You can also catch the live stream at crpc.tv. And now here's a look at the next Truths That Transform. I was incorporating this critical race theory and the social justice mindset even into my family worship. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.